Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings 2021 RBC Heritage DraftKings Picks and Preview. Remember to smash the like button out there and give me your two favorite plays in the $6,000 area this week on DraftKings. Also, if you're listening to the podcast, rate, review, and subscribe. As always, it'd be greatly appreciated. Plus, you need to join the newsletter. Newsletter will be going out on Wednesday, talking about more of the golf that we don't touch on on the show, ownership projections, all that sort of thing. Plus, uh, there are some more giveaways inside that newsletter. So please hit the description, join the Mayo Media newsletter, and it comes right to your email inbox. It's super easy to read. So uh, people seem to be enjoying it so far. So I'm going to try to keep it up and keep it going as long as possible. So thank you all for subscribing so far. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo gets you 20% off Fantasy National, the biggest stat engine database in the golf world, plus all of the tools, all the customizable stats. Uh, if you want to build some lineups, it's the way to go. If you want to get in on the DraftKings PGA game, or if you'd like to bet on DraftKings, you can use all the tools up there as well. Joining me on the line right now to break down the field, the man who hit CT Pan at this event two years ago from DK Live and PGA Tour Live, it is Reed Fowler. What's up, man? How's it going? What an introduction. No, I was going to say that I'm just honored to be here because this is the Mayo Major. This is your tournament, and I, and I feel like everyone should be taking your lead on this one when you hit that Kadira number or that Kadira win, excuse me. Um, but yeah, CT Pan, that's probably the biggest hit that I've ever that I've ever had, which is nice. Yeah, well, we have not been on the show since you joined the PGA Live team doing, or you've done one tournament so far. What's that yeah. like, by the way? So when you log on to like PGA Live on the web and watch the featured groups, yeah. all of a sudden, Reed Fowler's voice is there. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, their, their operation down there is great. Um, it's, I think the one thing that I, that I, maybe you and I talked about it or it was talked about in the industry is that I think this is a first step and I didn't really realize it until after when I was reading the comments on Twitter, uh, and everyone was so gracious and saying, congratulations, is that this was the first step that you and I, and people in our, in our industry and in our part of it, right. Uh, get into the mainstream. And that's something that, you know, I didn't necessarily think about at first, but when I was doing it, I was saying this at some point is going to be you doing it. It's going to be Feinberg, myself, and all of us who have this background in, in DFS and sports betting now being part of the conversation. When you're, when you're down there, it, it's just a lot of fun, right? Even though you're only following two or three groups, uh, featured groups, it's going to be more at some point, right? And so it's just a matter of doing live sports. And even though golf is a little bit slower it's still like a, a bang bang type of thing which is a lot of fun well this will be a really fun one to do it for because the rbc heritage now is 136 players in the field after bryson dechambeau withdrew on monday so he is no longer in the field they're not replacing him with anyone at this point um and just this field and this course allows itself to so many different types of players who can win like being a bomber isn't a huge advantage at harbor town it's a par 71 it's just around 7100 yards uh the par fives are you know you don't really get too many eagle chances on them and the average driving distance at this course is like 267 versus 283 per your average event i went back and looked at dustin johnson's par four driving stats history at this course i think he's a good barometer of this because he's one of the longest players on the tour I mean, he's not bright and he's not even Will Gordon at this point when it comes to driving distance, but he still is one of the longest guys. And on the par fours in his career at Harbor Town, his average driving distance is 286. So that should really tell you something about the forced layups and the way that players have to attack these courses. So when you're dialing in this week, statistically, irons and putting, that's really all you need to be looking at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that gives, like you mentioned, especially guys that we're going to get to in a little bit that are cheaper than, than Dustin Johnson and the elite guys, it gives them a chance, a really good chance to win. If you look at the past winners here and their odds, you know, Webb Simpson obviously was 30 to one last, last year, but I would argue that that was a big number on a guy who this, this is basically his course right here in Wyndham uh, at Sedgefield Country Club are, are the two places you want to play Webb. So, yeah, absolutely. I think there's some players that we're both probably going to mention more, more me than you that we're probably not going to like. But, hey, this is RBC Heritage. There's some big numbers that have been hit here. No, for sure. And last year was a bit of an outlier as well. Although Webb does play this tournament every single year, it was the second tournament out of COVID. And it had 
a WGC field, essentially, but with even more players at the back end. It was a WGC field with a cut attached to it because those first, like, five events coming out of the break when golf returned just drew the best fields possible. And that's not what we normally see at the Heritage being the week after the Masters. A lot of guys take some time off. Although this field, by and large, is better than most other years by a substantial margin. Yeah, was it 10 of the top 20 players, uh, if we don't get any withdrawals today, um, I, I think are in this field. And, and that's great, which I, I would like to get your opinion on this. Like so much win equity you feel like is at the top, right? Which gives us better numbers down the board. But I also think too that, like you mentioned, it's not just the guys who are here, which I think plays more into the, uh, the sports books and having those numbers uh, stay situated. It, it allows us to get those bigger numbers on guys that we saw shorter numbers earlier in the year. Um, I don't want to jump to it too too much, but guys like Sam Burns, right? Even though he's kind of missed his window, you see that number there, and you're like, "This is this is crazy. This wasn't this was half what it was, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago." So um, that's really interesting about this course, and it's a fun course to watch as well. Yeah, it's I think Harbor Town and just watching this tournament with just there's so many different weird elements to it where almost anyone in the field can succeed here if they're having a good week. But then you throw in the aspect of the wind that can come right off the coast. We didn't see that materialize last year for the first time. It was the first time in the last three years where there wasn't at least one round where wind completely just wiped out the field, which throws an interesting variable into everything if that happens again. And I'll be going over the weather both in the newsletter and on Wednesday's live show where I'll be taking questions about this tournament that I just it it's fun the the variable elements to everything uh, I think make for a really cool watch Uh, and the course itself is just very unique looking it's a Pete Dye course obviously and just looking at it on TV it's like oh yeah okay Um, you can hit a ton of greens and regulation here although the green sizes are some of the smallest on the PGA Tour I always reference the year that both Graham Dillette had a great run at this event and who was the other guy? Jason Duffner had a great run at this event. All they basically did was hit every green in regulation through three rounds. And then they finally started missing some greens in round four. And both those guys, the short games gave up on them. They bled all the strokes back to the field. So looking at the stats on fantasy national, it was kind of striking to see around the green weight in more to the top 10 historically than off the tee. And that just kind of blew my mind. But the one thing I did want to kind of mention about uh, some of the longer-esque winners that we've seen here, do you think that we see that again this year, knowing the field is a lot stronger? Yeah, that's the one thing, right? It's I don't think we do. I, I do think that there are some some chances that we're going to want to take just because of, of what we just mentioned, what we just laid out about the course and how it plays. But yeah, I do think that so much, and again, in, DraftKing, in the DraftKings context of it, so much of the pricing and value, I think, is that that eight to nine K range? I think there's a, a ton of value, both win equity from a an outright betting perspective and also on DraftKings. I that doesn't mean though that we're not gonna get these guys. So like people are gonna watch the, the, the casual golfer golf fans gonna watch me like who the hell is Chase Seifert or who the hell is is you know this guy, right? Like that's we're gonna get that because the RBC Heritage, like this course that just gives lends itself to it. And like you mentioned, if you got if you ride a hot putter at this course, doesn't matter who you are. Uh, you're going to win. You're going to win because of, of how this course sets up. All right, well, let's jump into the pricing, the 10K level. Dustin Johnson, the number one player in the world, still is at the very top. Early ownership projections show that no one is using him at $11,600. So we can talk about that more in a second. Cantley, Webb, Morikawa, Cameron Smith, and Daniel Hauserberger. I love Morikawa here. This just seems like the perfect Morikawa course. I believe he missed the cut uh, when they played this in his only appearance last year coming out of the break. Actually, no, sorry. He was 64th in the field that week. He gained off the tee, lost on approach, lost around the green, and lost on the greens. Uh, He doesn't usually lose on approach. That's something that doesn't happen to him very often. As you can see, he's number one in the field over the past 24 rounds, number one tee to green as well. Uh, I know that he's going to be able to hit the fairways and control the driver. I know that the iron's going to be locked in with Morikawa. It just comes down to, is he going to gain strokes putting? In three of the past five events where he has gained strokes putting, he's won. So I'm just going to go with that guy. Yeah. Are you worried about his around the green? No. Like, that's the one thing. Yeah. Like, right, because his irons are so good, right? <laughs> if he gets on the green, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and so that's the one thing that gives me pause about Morikawa. But it's, it's, a, it's a very short, uh, short-lived pause because you're right. The irons are there. We saw it at Augusta National. Um, he didn't consistently have, you know, the best putting 
uh, week at, at Augusta, but like that happens to everybody. It happens to the best. We know how good Morikawa, Morikawa is, a major winner, WGC winner. So yeah, at this price tag, right, he's finally properly priced to where you're not like, oh my God, this guy's in the 9K range. We're going to have to smash this. Uh, and he's not 30 to one coming into it. But uh, the guy that I really like is Daniel Berger. You mentioned him at $10,000. And if DJ is sub 10%, uh, this is like, that's something that you always have to consider even when he's at 11.6. But I like Daniel Berger with the win already at a Coastal course. You see, like to, to me, the Augusta National poor outing doesn't really mean much. This guy is, in terms of, of ball striking, one of the best. You see it there, top 10. So I like Berger. I like him on these coastal courses. I like him on these shorter courses as well, like par 70, par 71 type courses. Yeah. Uh, and then there's always just a way that you can play this where it's a lot like playing Spieth at the Masters last week where you made the decision, are you going to play him or are you not going to play him? I decided to play him. That actually worked out for me for like the first time in ages. But Webb Simpson is that guy at this course. Do you just play Webb and lock in your top 10 and try to figure out the rest from there? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And look, Webb, like Webb, he played, he played all right. Right. He played great. Uh, like leading in, I believe Thursday, Friday was, was, you know, vintage Webb. He was hitting his irons really well last week and then just kind of just faltered a little bit. And that's what we kind of seen with Webb is that he's been such a consistent player, but over the last handful of tournaments, we've seen some inconsistency with his irons, but fading Webb at RBC or fading Webb at Wyndham is a fool's errand. I think I'm with you. Like I'm planting a flag and saying I'm playing Webb at 10-7, you know, and it, you know, I'm probably overweight in the field just because, right, like you mentioned, if you don't, it's pretty stupid because this course he just takes he takes apart. One thing to look at with Dustin Johnson, I'm looking through the estimated strokes gain numbers from the Masters right now, and if the numbers are to be believed, he lost almost 3.7 strokes putting in his two rounds at the Masters. So I, we've seen him make the run here. It was funny. He was winning by two when C.T. Pan ended up winning that year, which is kind of mind-boggling that it was C.T. Pan who went and chased him down. We know that Dustin plays this tournament every year. He's an RBC sponsor, so he has to kind of show up for these events. Uh, and he generally has pretty rudimentary finishes, nothing to really write home about, uh, which is kind of funny. Like, he's played it five times, three of the past three years, 17th, 28th, and 16th. Uh, he does most of his work off the tee here. He is one of the few guys that really does gain. I just do think that, and I'll wait for the ownership projections to mature just a little bit, but even at his high price point, there are so many guys in the 6K range that I like this week that it's no problem yeah. to play Dustin. Even if I wanted to pair him with Webb or Morikawa, I don't think I would have that much of a problem making a roster I didn't hate. So that might be the route that I take. Just play Dustin and hopefully he gets his shit back together this week. Yeah, or do like what happened in Augusta, the guy who won the Millie Maker is fade these top guys, which I don't think is smart, but I do think the balance construction is going to be contrarian. Uh, even with the value that you see between the nine, seven and the eights, I, I, I do think that people are going to look at that and say, we, we have some primetime players here. There's a strong field. And to, to, to what you just said is that there is a lot of value, I think in the six K range that we usually don't get at this course. Yes, we get the long shots, but this, with these, with these guys here, right. 10 of the top 20, you're going to see the the stars and scrubs play, I think, a little bit more than the balanced lineup. But yeah, you're right. Like when you when you take a look at these guys and how they play, um, you know, anything can happen. CT Pan chase down chasing down DJ is one of my favorite memories. The year that I had all the success on DraftKings at this tournament, that's exactly the approach that I had. I didn't play anyone in the 10,000s. I had three 9K guys and worked myself down from there. So it's a viable strategy at this course because we've talked about that almost any skill set can win. So if one of the top end guys doesn't go out and kind of run train on everyone, you're looking a whole lot better. The two other ones in this range, uh, the one I have projected at by far the lowest ownership is Cam Smith. And then there's Cantlay, who... It's funny to see the early ownership numbers on him is that he's around like double what DJ is. And I thought that was really strange coming off the week that he just had. Is it one of these situations where everyone's just like, ah, let's give him a gimme on that one. Or is it like, oh yeah, no one's going to play Patrick Cantlay. So I'm going to be really sneaky and play Patrick Cantlay. Then it turns out that everyone plays Patrick Cantlay. Yeah. The double reverse. Um, yeah. I don't know with Cantlay, man. I, I just have no read on Cantlay. Look, like if you take a look at just his, his recent form, right? The miscut players and masters, you know, that should give you some pause, especially with the guys around him. But like, I just don't know where his game is at. And I think it comes down to the fact that he's played well, right? Like he gets second place at the Amex, almost chased down Siwoo there, had a great Sunday, um, which is 
not a, a Pete Dye. It is, it's, it, there's a Pete Dye course, but it's not as Pete Dye esque as places like RBC, like, like TPC Sawgrass. Um, and we've seen him do well on Dye courses, right? So all the stats are lining up. He just didn't do any, like he, he looked atrocious at Augusta. So that's enough for me to, to, to say, I'm going to be overweight on web. I'm going to look at playing DJ as much as I can because that, because of his two X ownership over DJ uh, in round two at the masters. Cantley actually, he didn't really turn it around, but he did gain with his irons. He did gain around the green, continued to not putt whatsoever. And I think that die correlation is kind of interesting here. Like you mentioned the American express, they played three rounds at the Pete die tournament course this year, where they normally only play two. And obviously that's where Cantley went and put up his huge number. Uh, he had the huge, it was funny. It was like back to back rounds. He had the back, he had the final round at Amex and then the first round at Pebble beach. And he was like 20 under par for combined in those two rounds. Rounds. But again, that's a shorter coastal course, did really well there. And then if you look at the match play, he just parsed through the strokes gained data. No, he didn't advance, but he was probably the best player in the round robin phase, T to green, and just weirdly lost a match and then got bounced in a playoff. And that was the end of him. Yeah, and it would be nice though, right? If, even if he was coming in, I think, and I think the, the DJ, like the, the comparison that she made with him and DJ. Uh, of DJ being half of what he is right now. And we don't know yet, right? It's, it's only Tuesday. We got a, a day and a half left of people, you know, uh, gesticulating over like what they want to do with their lineups. But like, I, I just, right now, I think what we've seen from Cantlay, it's not even necessarily like his closing on Sundays of those two, where he just did like, he played well in one, but they didn't close. And, and then Berger won. Like, I, I just, I don't have a great feel on Cantlay and, you know, he's a great player, but I want to play all the other guys, even Cam Smith. If you look at Cam Smith and what he's done uh, over his last four or five tournaments, he's been great. Uh, the putting, it, you know, is coming around for Smith. The around the green is nice. So if he does get a little wayward with his irons, then I do like what he does around the greens. And like you mentioned, no one is going to be playing this guy. And he, what did he do? He just another great performance at Augusta National. So I do like that more so than a guy like Cantlay. Well, I just look at Cantlay, and I think the reason that everyone is going to him is the course history. He's played the RBC yep. Heritage three times. He's never finished worse than seventh in any of those three starts. Uh, so that's probably a reason to get on him this week. I, I am very curious to see where that ownership trends throughout the week, because even if I had to play a DJ Cantlay lineup, Probably feel pretty good about that. But you're right about Cam Smith. Even he has he doesn't have quite the course history here. He's played it five times, made the cut only three times. His best finish is a 15th. That was the very first time he played this event five years ago. But coming in fourth, 11th, 17th, 10th, uh, you know, those are WGCs, the players, the masters, and Genesis. Those aren't scrub events. So he continues to hold his own in a lot of these. And it is a course where his bad driving likely won't get him into as much trouble. Now, if he loses three strokes off the tee, he's going to be fucked. But, you know, you hope he pushes with the field off the off the tee and then does the rest of the Cam Smith stuff the rest of the time. Right, exactly. Right. And again, this is a tournament like you like we keep on harping on, like the harping on is that. I don't think you need to be extreme. Like, I don't, I don't think you need to chase the chalk, uh, even though, like, I'm saying, like, I really like Webb. I do think there's opportunities for a guy like Cam Smith to do well here um, and just because of what he's able to do. Uh, but like I said, uh, Patrick Cantlay is someone that I'm willing to, to be wrong about and, and be okay with that. Yeah, it's funny. I don't want to spend too much time harping on the top and even in the 9Ks, but I find this board so much easier to parse the lower we get down, and I find the top of the board really difficult to figure out who to put in my lineups. Yeah. Like It seems like everyone from Sergio at $8,600 and up, you can make a pretty viable case for, and then once you get past that, it's like, okay, I like this guy, I like this guy, but I find the top of the board super confusing. Yeah, I mean, what do we do with Will Zalatoris? I know we'll get to that in a little bit, but you're abs you're absolutely right. I, I think it's an embarrassment of riches, right? We usually at this course have our guys like Webb, we have our uh, CT pens, the players that we do like, the Kevin Nas, uh, and we Kevin Kisner, right? We usually play these guys at this type of course, but now we're introducing a whole nother bag, a whole nother uh, onslaught of, of players who who really can play well uh, and and course setup like a Colin Morikawa. I mean, when you look at his stats, right? You see ones across the board. That is really hard to get away from. But then you see other guys like Webb who don't have ones, but usually play this course extremely well. What do you do? Um, and when when that's the case, I really like to stay away from uh, uh, being married to the stats. Um, and maybe more so when we get down to the, the lower salary guys. So much of, of the, the, the narrative that you put in your mind 
and the dialogue is, well, because this guy does well from a stat side, which is, which is a viable strategy. When that's the case, when I can't really wrap my head around it, I try to stay away and, and uh, divorce myself from the stats as much as I can. So for me, in the 10Ks, it's Morikawa. Then I'll figure out someone to pair with him, probably DJ if things can't keep up like this. But maybe Cam Smith, like you talked about, if no buzz ends up going through him. 9Ks, we got Zalatoris, Will Z, Hatton, Connors, Casey, Fitzpatrick, and Sungjae. My early gut told me, go with Sungjae. It's a short Bermuda course. He's not hitting his irons well. He's putting the lights out. He's driving the ball really well. Another guy coming off a bad week at the Masters. But then I went and looked at his history at the Heritage. For whatever reason, he doesn't play this course well. Yeah, you think it's because, uh, maybe it's because of he's just played so much golf <laughs> before he gets here, so he's a little fatigued. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like I looked at Sanjay as well, and I really wanted to, to make a case for him at $9,000. I think that's a great price for what his upside is. But I mean, my favorite in this range are, are guys that are below, or excuse me, my favorite, uh, some of my favorite plays are guys below him. And in this range, I think it's Paul Casey. Um, when you looked at his Sunday round at Augusta, uh, it, he, he had a couple of heaters. Like he had like a, a birdie streak of four. Uh, yes, he, he gave that back just because he, he didn't have his full game going. He is doing a new putting stroke though. He's got the reverse uh, putting stroke right now where the, the, the front hand is low. And, and he was trying that out. And that's what the broadcast was telling. Colt Nost gave us the inside scoop that he, he de uh, deployed that strategy in Sunday's round, but he was putting extremely well. And then if he brings that here and his course history and his ability to play well on Pete Dye courses, I really like him at $9,200. I think for me, I mean, it's hard for me to get away from Hatton, who's a top 10 player in the world at this price, especially because he was in the mix uh, last time around last year at Heritage. A lot of that was putting related though. And then on paper, Matthew Fitzpatrick always rates out well for this course. This is where you think that he would play really well. And then looking at his master's numbers, it's a very atypical Fitzpatrick performance. I think he ended up coming in now, like 24th or something like that but he gained almost a stroke off the tee per round he gained a half a stroke with his irons per round lost a half a stroke around the green and lost half a stroke on the green like that is the exact opposite of how you would think that Matthew Fitzpatrick would play wouldn't it yeah right and, and you mentioned it too right his off the tee game is has come into form of the last handful of weeks and since he's been in the states he's been playing really well but you're right like you I mean like, are, are we buying the dip, so to speak, on Matty Fitzpatrick? Not necessarily in price, but in perception, right, where he was he was hot for like a month. And now we see him and like, you're kind of like, meh, okay, there's other guys like you mentioned, like a guy like, like Terrell Hatton, who did bring it back around, even though he was looking up to the sky, palms up at, at certain points at Augusta National. He brought it back around at, at a course, right, at Augusta, where he doesn't necessarily play well. So... Like Fitzpatrick to me right now is someone that I'm also fading, which might bite me in the ass. But at the same time, I do think that riding the hot Will Z, I, I, I could get behind that. I'm not personally doing it, but I'm putting like a lot of stake and I'm planting my flag on Casey because I know that he's going to come in uh, with a lot of popularity. Early projections do show that this entire range, except for Sungjae, is going to be like over 15% owned. So I yes. do think that you're going to just see, I, and I think a lot of people are very comfortable with the low sevens and sixes. So you might even be able to jam two of these guys plus a 10K guy into your lineup and just roll it out that way if you wanted to. And I think that some people will do that balance strategy like you talked about, maybe use two or three players from this range or two of these guys plus answer who's going to be super popular this week. And I don't think that's a bad strategy, but I could see myself not using anyone in the 9Ks. Like, the, on paper, you can make the case for all of them. Zalatoris, Hatton, Connors especially. Like, this seems like a very good Corey Connors course because if he's hitting greens in regulation, these are small greens. The three-putt percentage of this course is almost non-existent. So, you know, maybe he'll just get lucky and start rolling in some putts. And I do think that Valero is a pretty good comp course. Like, obviously, Wyndham and mm. Sony and Honda when you look at those ones. But if you just look at who plays well at that, ever since they've moved Valero to that course, that all all of a sudden you're like oh okay i can see what, like there's a lot of crossover names like it's a course where brennan grace plays really well and he, obviously he's won here it's a course where siwoo kim plays really well obviously he plays really well here it's it's pete die adjacent it feels like and mm. you know cory connors has a win at that course as well so uh, it's really tough for me to kind of parse here but i can see myself fading this entire range and just overloading on the 10ks yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just waiting for Connors to do the rug pull on us. Right? Like he's been playing 
so good uh, recently. Guys, like number one, like in my stat model, I see him as number one. And so I don't know if that's because I just uh, extremely overweight on approach and, uh, and you know, and, and good drives, right? When you look at just uh, that stat, he's also number one. So he's hitting it well. His proximity from that 175 to 200, which you see a, a large distribution, I think the most, right, at this course because the guys are clubbing down off the tee. Uh, and that just makes the most sense. And you, like you mentioned, those, those forced layover or those forced uh, carries, um, you see him. He's also a guy who plays extremely well. And he's top 25 in that of the last 24 rounds. So the stat model loves Corey Connors. The guy is just, he, he's up on leaderboards. That's the one thing, right, that people are now getting to know Corey Connors is. Um, I'm just worried that even though the stats, the, the Fantasy National loves him, I'm just worried that at some point, that, that Corey Connors that we know and love uh, might have hit, hit us like a ton of bricks. Yeah, maybe he's just upped his game. He's at a completely different level at this point. Maybe he's just leveled yeah. up, and that's just going to be the case. 8K, guys. Answer, going to be super popular. 8900 bucks. Fleetwood, Harmon, Sergio, Lowry, English, Westwood, Horschel, Kevin Na, Matt Kuchar, and... Russell, I don't know, Russell Henley is $7,900. Kuchar is $8,000. bucks. Kuchar's interesting because he's started to play well at like old school Matt Kuchar courses, this being one of said courses. But I look at Sergio at 86. I don't care what he did last week. I love him at this course. So I'm going to play Sergio at 86. And Billy Ho getting no love at $8,200. bucks. Uh, i will change that. I like Billy Horschel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, if Kevin Na wasn't right below Billy Ho, uh, and Kevin, I think, is, is maybe slightly overpriced, even at $8,100. I would have loved him in the 7K range, but probably sediment would have been a lot higher. Um, I, I think you're right, though. Billy Ho should not be $8,200, especially with this guy who was in contention just a few weeks ago. You, I mean, he won the match play, for God's sakes. I don't know how he's not, uh, you know, in the high 8K range. You're right. Answer is going to be extremely popular. I still like him. I think this is a this is a place that he can have his first win on the PGA Tour. I think a lot of people think that. The books also uh, are hedging against that, that, that a lot of people are on that same uh, sediment. The guy that I really, really, really like in this range is Harris English at $8,400. When you take a look at what he was after TOC, he was god-awful, right? Like fatigue, whatever it was, hit him, and he just was playing bad. Now with, you know, back-to-back top 30s, um, and then his best performance, I believe, at Augusta, now he comes to a coastal course where we've seen Harris English play well at the RSM. We've seen him play well at Wildlife Country Club. He's played well here. This is his style of course where you get him on a shorter Bermuda course and he's trending now in that direction. And if he's going to be less than, you know, 10% rostered, I think that's a seal for a guy that at $8,400, you're going to see, like you mentioned, there's, there's big names in this range. I think Harris English is sort of on the second tier of those big names in this range, and I really like him this week. I, I can get behind Harris English for sure. Just looking at the projections right now, it's Harmon, it's Answer, and everyone else is below 10%. So you can kind of pick and choose who you want. If this is an area where you want to get a little bit contrarian, I feel like all of these guys are kind of the same. So just hope you pick right and don't pick the super chalky guy. Make sure the chalky guy doesn't hit, and you're good to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you're right, though, man. I, like when you look at Billy Horschel, like you never want to play Billy Horschel. And then when you see him in the top five after, you know, Friday or Saturday, you're like, why the hell didn't I play Billy Horschel? Uh, he's a great player. And we know he goes on streaks, right? Like that's that's his game, too. When he when he finds something, we see him uh, at the first page of the leaderboard for the next three or four tournaments or at least contending or excuse me, or at least at some point in the in the round that he's that he's playing well. So. I really like that Billy Hole call. I'm just trying to trying to find his Masters stats here. Let's let's see what he did at the Masters from an off the tee and everything perspective over four rounds because he made it all four rounds. So off the tee, Billy Horschel gained, lost on approach, lost around the green. He lost a lot on approach uh, and then gained on the green. So it's kind of a typical Billy Horschel performance when he doesn't have everything going, makes a cut, but that's really about all that he's up to. I, I can just... If no one's going to use him, I'm okay using him. It, like, it would almost be like Westwood, although it seems like he's on fumes at the moment. Do you have any interest in Kuchar? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I see what you're saying, though, right? Like, you started to see him more at, at the match play. Uh, and when he's he's just playing better on those courses. But I still have, I, I, I'm the silly person that has to wait to see him Kuchar first and then play him chalk and then him miss the cut. Yeah, that, makes, that sounds about right. It's usually what I do as well. <laughs> 7K range. 
at the Heritage. Uh, if we at the end, I think that we're going to do a new segment called the best plays, and we'll make a lineup of all of the clear obvious plays, and three of them are at the yeah. very top of the seven thousand dollar range. Henley Hoffman, see, woo, Kim. I don't know what to do with them. Like, can you play all three of them? Do you have to pick between one of them? <sighs> I just, I can't wrap my mind around it because Hoffman's playing so well. Obviously, this is a Siwoo course, and he's playing well. And this really sets up for Henley, fantastically, too. Right, right, exactly. Uh, Henley has been on fire with his irons. He's, like, he's gained with his irons in 17 of his last 18 major uh, measured events. Like, But that's, like, typical, right? That is typical Russell Henley. Now we get him on a Bermuda course. We know that he has good, like he's got great finishes, a win at, at comp courses like Wildlife Country Club. Uh, yeah, this was this is a tough one. I, I'm also in the same camp as you, but like I, you know, once once Siwoo won the Amex and, and we see him like and he won the players, like you have to plan a flag of like play Siwoo at Pete Dye courses no matter what, and he's playing and he's playing well. So if I had to rank it, I'd probably go Siwoo, Henley, and then Hoffman. Okay. Anyone else in the sevens? Because I bet Henley at 80 to 1. I also bet Matt Wallace at 80 to 1. I just feel like his irons are firing at the moment. And this seems like a course where he can go win. Uh, He seems undervalued in this field versus some of the other competitors, I think. Yeah, I I think there's a couple of guys. Um, I'm very interested in Sam Burns um, just because of what I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm looking at a little bit more long form. Like I mentioned, like too, it's like, especially when I get down here, I don't, I try to divorce myself from the stats too much. I still think that they're like, that you have to look at them as, as part of the story, but I do like Sam Burns. I know that he can get it out there with his driver. uh, And that's really like where his advantage is. But at the same time, like Sam Burns way back when was a really, really good putter. Like that's really how he started to, to, to soar up leaderboards is with his putting. And I don't think it just goes away. Yes, he can lose it. Any player can lose it, a la Ricky Fowler right now. But I do like Sam Burns at $7,400. And then last but not least in this range is Lucas Glover at $7,100. The glove? This is the, the glove. This is the this is when you talked about it, Pat, at the beginning of the show, is that hot iron, hot putter, close your eyes, a guy to get on a heater. Lucas Glover has either had a hot, uh, like a, a great approach tournament or a great putting tournament. Right. I'm, I'm banking on this shorter par 71 course uh, where he puts those together at seventy one hundred dollars. I, I think that's someone and I think that a lot of people are going to go towards CT pan, which is great. Shout out CT. I will always love you. But uh, I like the glove this week. So the glove has made the cut five of the past six years at this course, but he has no finish better than T21, which I found very surprising. He tends to bleed a lot of strokes around the green on these green complexes for whatever reason. And the ball striking is going to be really good. His irons were magical at Valero to get himself back into it as well. Like we didn't even mention Chris Kirk and Ian Poulter or Kisner. Mm. Kisner, Poulter, and Kirk uh, are all guys that just you think they would play really well here. And over time, they have played really well here. But it's Wallace, Grace, and Bezadenhout are the ones that I'm looking at. This almost seems tailor-made for Bezadenhout, only because he's terrible off the tee. But let's just say you can hit some fairways, he'll be good to go. The irons are good, the chipping is good, the putting is good. This course is a perfect formula for him to go win a tournament. Yeah, but I I don't know why, and this might be completely just uh, my own narrative playing out in my head. Like I just see him playing well at tougher courses in like tougher fields. This is a, you know, a strong field, like we mentioned, but, and it might, this might be stupid logic, but like this course feels too easy for him. If that makes sense. This course right? isn't, like, this I, course isn't easy though. It was easy last year. Cause there was no elements true. in play. And then the course record got broken, but most of the time, like true. you need to be able to go out and make your birdies. There's low scores available, but you know, shooting 74 is not out of the question here either for anyone. That's true. And 30, a 37 at Wyndham is not bad at all. He gained, you know, what, almost six strokes putting uh, at, at Wyndham. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Like, you know, you've sold me on Bazunho. Like, at first, right, at first glance, right, because we like the top three guys at the 7 9, uh, I, I glanced over Bazenhut and didn't really give him a second thought. But yeah, come think of it now, too, when you, when you take a look at his game, like he, like you mentioned, he hasn't gained off a tee on, on, on tour in quite some time. So, it, like, if that, at this course, you don't need it, right? So it really mitigates that. So yeah, I can get by Christian. Christian Bezadenhout last week at the Masters. 
did all it was all short game for him. I mean, round one was actually really good for him. Uh, he gained everywhere. He gained off the thieves, gained with his irons. He was making all the putts, and then made fewer and fewer drives and irons matter throughout the course of the week. And he just barely held on to make the cut after his immaculate first round. So I don't hate him. I don't know if he'll end up being on the final short list. That's just kind of the way that I'm seeing the top of the 7,000, the bottom of the 7,000. You mentioned Burns. I'll take a pass on Burns. I'll take a pass on Munoz and Cam Davis and Ortiz, all the guys I'd normally play. The ones I'm using Aaron Wise at 7,300 bucks. And I really like Michael Thompson at 7,200 bucks here. I think that he is perfectly situated for this course. When you go back and look at his recent form in terms of irons, there's only two ranges where he gains from, and it's 150 to 175, 175 to 200, and that's where the vast majority of his strokes are going to be coming this week. We're back on Bermuda. We know he can putt on that type of surface better than anywhere else, and I was really impressed with what I saw with him at the Masters. That's one of the great things about the Masters app is that you can go back and watch the shots. Everyone wants to see, oh, how did Hideki win? Oh, how did Xander lose? No, no, I'm going to scout Michael Thompson here, and he actually impressed me with the way that he played at the Masters. <laughs> That's great. Like, everyone wants, I, like, I hope we just cut that. Everyone wants to see how a decky wins. No, I'm looking at Michael Thompson. Uh, yeah. I mean, look, Arby's like, like the last year, he finished top 10 year. Uh, uh, Michael Thompson did, where he gained, well, like, you know, almost five strokes to to green. So you know that he likes this course. He can play well here. A top five at the Amex, a top 20, what was it? A top 25 at Sony. Absolutely. I was really intrigued because I, I I caught your guys' show yesterday with you in Feinberg, and you, you mentioned Aaron Wise. I had no idea. Right? I had no idea he played well on these coastal courses, but he's someone that I think a lot of people just say, guy can bomb it. Guy won AT&T Byron Nelson at Trinity Forest. He can bomb it. That's the type of course that we've seen him win at. But no, you're right. And we've seen Wise play well in strong fields, right? He's He's been leaders at some majors, you know, like on a Saturday or Friday, Saturday. So uh, that's someone that everyone should be interested in. Emiliano Grillo, that's the one guy that I was kind of like, oh, okay, like a short Bermuda, uh, 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 less than a par 72 course. That, that approach is definitely the thing. He doesn't putt. We know that. Um, hopefully he has a good putting day if you guys like to use him. But that's the one guy, too, that I have starred, but I'm probably going to unstar. I'm just trying to figure out. At what point do I do that? It's still about narrowing down this list. So I just want to get my list together yeah. and then I can start cutting people from it. So Wise and Thompson are on it. Pan is still on it for the moment. And I throw on Denny McCarthy. As Feinberg pointed out, like, isn't this a course where Denny could just putt and he'll be fine? It's like, yeah, it actually is one of those courses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, my list, if we're, if we're narrowing it down too as well, is Sam Burns, Lucas Glover, and then Siwoo Kim at the top. But I mean, uh, any one of those three guys at 7,900 or 79 to 78, Charlie Hoffman, I think are good plays. Yeah, I'm just looking at McCarthy, too. He's actually gained on approach in three straight events. Not a significant amount of strokes, but he's not bleeding them to the field. Uh, maybe you get like a, a break even off the tee week. Maybe he can gain a total of one or two strokes with his approach and just do the thing where he gains eight strokes putting and all of a sudden he's inside the top 10 again. Like, I don't hate, this is, there are certain courses where I think McCarthy is a very viable DraftKings player. And even if you just go and look through his results, I, I think that you can see that as well. Like, where has he played well? Oh, he played well at the Honda, a short Bermuda course where he puts the lights out. You know, at the Bermuda Championship, fourth. Sanderson Farms, sixth. The Wyndham, ninth. How has he done at this course over time? RSM, eighth. Uh, it just, yeah. there's a certain style of course where he kind of shows up. He has a 33rd and a missed cut here. He missed the cut last year against that tougher field, but he was 33rd the year before that. And you know, he gained his over four strokes putting, lost on approach, broke even uh, with the field off the tee and gained around the greens. Like that's sort of going to be the Denny McCarthy blueprint, but you don't have to pay much for him is the thing. And if you can get that outlier week, like it's one of these situations where we always talk about the Connors and the lists and the Byunhan Ans, and even to a certain extent, Hideki is these guys are such good ball strikers. That's so consistent for them. If they ever just putt during the course of a week, they are going to win. And we've seen that play itself out over time, but I do think there is something to the Denny McCarthy's of the world. And even Mackenzie Hughes, as we've seen time after time, that mm. if they just strike it kind of okay, and they have their like normal hot putting week, like it's sort of the inverse for them. Like just be okay ball striking and figure out the rest like they can do that and him and Hughes both at seven thousand dollars at this sort of tournament where putting matters so much more than a lot of other events I could see them being viable yeah and I think psychologically at seven thousand dollars because of the other guys that we talked about I don't think much people are looking there right no. I don't think that because of, yeah because of 6k 
is there's a lot of value. Uh, I think you're right. Is that you also have to, like you have to find the pockets that if you're going to win a GPP, like you know, or you know, place like you did, you're going to have to find these these pockets where no one is talking about it. And yeah, of course, a guy like Satoshi, who's way down in the 6K range, no one is going to talk about as much. But you have to find a case for that. You know, here's one thing, Pat, that I'm you know I'm looking at. I know you're going to hate this call, but if that's a case, right, where approach. We're like, we, uh, approach is definitely something that you have to have here. Putting, definitely something that you have to have a, a hot putting week. Brendan Todd, who's he's been god awful with his irons for like the last two months, or like the last month, or last, you know, four to six tournaments. He's a great putter. And look at the past wins that he's had, right? He's had these wins on these coastal courses. Now, his current form is trash, it's garbage. Um, so you're going to have to kind of throw that out the window. But that's just an example of at seventy three hundred dollars, not coming in at a ton, a ton of ownership at all. That's someone that you could potentially make a case for. But you're right about the other guys. The one thing about Michael Thomas too that that I'll you know kind of throw it to you is right now on Fantasy National he's coming in at twelve percent as his projected ownership. At what point right does you are you going to go overweight on Michael Thompson or or what's what's your move there? I don't, I mean, I probably will end up, if I'm playing someone in my lineups, I narrow my core down so much that ownership really never makes that big of a difference for me because I'll play 20 lineups and I'll have 17 guys in those lineups and I'll use at least every player in three of them. So, you know, I'll be at 15% just through osmosis kind of thing uh, with that. But I, there's sometimes when you, and these are very early ownership projections for one thing. And I do think that the first run of ownership projections can get skewed based on like a lot of people who are members of Fantasy National watched the show on Monday. We were big, big talking Michael Thompson. I think as the week goes Mm -hmm. along, uh, it was, and even no matter where you look for ownership projections, whether it be Fantasy National or somewhere else, there are certain guys that you just know that the public aren't going to use. Uh, and that happened last week at the Masters. I forget who it was, but there was someone who was projected at like 13% ownership because everyone who looked at stats was all over the guy. And then no one, who, people who don't look at stats didn't know who this guy was. Fuck, I can't remember who it was. Now it's killing me. Uh, either way, that some of these guys get overinflated because their stats look really good and sharp people will be on them or quote unquote sharp people. I am not sharp. Uh, people like to think that I'm sharp. I am not. I'm very, very dull when it comes to picks. Trust me on this, especially lately. But when it comes to talking up someone, I think that with ownership percentage, it can get baked in negatively. And the longer the week goes along, the less that's going to be a problem. So no, I'm going to play Michael Thompson either way. I'm not too concerned about that. But Todd was actually one I wanted to bring up only because he gained with his irons at the Masters last week, which blew my mind. Right. That's what I mean, right? And he's second in putting over the last 24 rounds. Uh, And so he's someone, again, that, you know, there's a star by him right now. This kind of goes to your, your point as well, is that if you're looking at the ownership projection, tab on fantasy national and you see who's favored right like it's still way early like like don't take these things uh and and you know make them true right now because things still have to pan out but yeah i think and this is why too right this entire range all i i think you know up until the certain point in the 8k range there's a ton of value so i, I really like i really like playing these guys because they can hit at a course like uh, like harbor town let's talk the best range of the year, the 6K range at the Heritage. There are names down here. So, uh, Gim Reaper, the first of them all, 6,900 bucks. You're not going to be able to talk me off of a chalky Doug Gim. I'm just going to play him. I bet him at 140 to 1. Let's fucking go, Gim Reaper. He's underpriced here. But then you have the rest of them. So, guys, I have stars to currently, so you have to help me whittle down this list. Knox, Snedeker, Shez Reavy. Camillo Vizagas, Patton Kazire, who I really do like at $6,500, and Seifert would be the guys for me, and Ben Martin, who sneaky has played really well two events in a row. Ben Martin. Is he got, uh, who was the golfer that always used to wear the football hats? That wasn't Ben Martin. That's some, that was, that's that, that was Ben Curtis. Ben Curtis. Thank you very much. I almost said Curtis Martin, not the, uh, the running back from the Jets. But, uh, yeah, I like those calls. Uh, Pat, Pat Kazire, right? <laughs> we know what he, he plays yeah, wh- well on these wh- type of courses. Wh- where has Pat and Kazire won? And he's coming off being second in the field at Valero on approach. Like, that kind of got overlooked. Right. $6,500 is too cheap. And I don't think I would ever say that <laughs> for Pat and Kazire. But I, I'm with you there. I, I love the Chase Seifert call. No, like, no, like you mentioned, we just talked about it. No one knows who Chase Seifert is yet except for Ben Raza. And the people who watch uh, watch this show, um, I think that's a great call as well. 
um, just because of what he's been able to do and how he plays well, right? You're seeing the archetype of players that we like in this range. Doug Gim is way underpriced. You're right, $6,900. I will not belabor the point for the Gim Reaper. Way, way, way underpriced. But your guy is right next to him. I love Luke List here. Uh, I could, these shorter courses uh, were Luke List, and I took this tip from you, a shorter course for whatever reason, uh, and it's not the only places that he can play well, Luke List tends to show up. He has, you know, a great performance. He has, I think, a top three here. Um, and I believe a top 25 or a top 30 at the Amex this season. The irons are definitely there. The putting is the one thing, right? Like we just talked about, the putting has to be there. But I think you can make a case for Luke List. And one guy at the $6,600 mark, Pat, K.H. Lee. Give me some K.H. Lee. He's a guy that, I, you know, when you take a look at, at the stats, the approach is there. Yes, he loses around the greens quite a bit. Yes, he can be very, uh, you can see a lot of red. It'd be like the red wedding with this putter. But when this guy goes, he can go. And I believe he was runner up just recently. Uh, and I forget what course it was at, but he was runner up just recently and another top finish at the Amex um, and, and top finishes at some other coastal courses. So I like KH Lee at 6,600. Yeah, it was Phoenix. He came in second to Brooks. Uh, after just kind of plotting away, the coverage never showed him on Sunday, but he ended up coming in second. So that's just what happens when you're KH Lee, I suppose. List, I can't get behind. Here's why. He's gained putting in five of six of the last events, and he doesn't have a good finish to show for it oh. whatsoever. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but like yeah, that, that should give you some confidence of like, okay, maybe the putter's coming around. And, uh, yeah, you're right. Like that doesn't, but like that doesn't work. But again, seventh in ops gain. So you know he's doing well in that department. Uh, if it becomes a birdie fest, right? We've seen it. We've seen this course become a birdie fest if the, if the win is rather benign. So uh, and he's what top fifteen or top twenty in that in that category. So I, I do like it as the the inventor of basketball. Your boy Matt Neesmith is also there as well. But of those sixty nine hundred dollars, yeah, I think the most uh, the most uh, egregious pricing right now is Gim at sixty nine. Uh, the only one that I would go to even lower than this that I'm thinking about now, just because it's a web course and I have this guy kind of paired with web in my mind, uh, and the only like three courses he plays well are RSM. Wyndham and here is T Dunks, 6,100 bucks. Top 30 Dunks here last year. And he's actually gained in one, two, three, four, five, six consecutive events. Gained off the tee at Valero and Honda. He missed the cut in two of those, uh, even at the players. Just very, very poor putting performances from him recently, which, you know, you're going to get, but he's a very accurate player, good with his irons. Uh, and he's like the homeless man's Webb Simpson, and they tend to play at the same courses. But he's only $6,100. So the strategy that I'm kind of looking at here is I'm just, uh, right now I have, well, how many people start? 21 players start. And that only includes two players above 10,000, no one in the nines, and three guys in the eights. I might just roll with like that solid core, maybe add one more 10K guy into the mix or a 9K guy, and just play those yeah. guys in like 75% of lineups and just mix and match from the bottom with one of these losers. Yeah, all right. And another guy, like we're going to mention losers here. And so stop me if I'm getting too, uh, like too chaotic here and disorganized. But yeah, I mean, the, the players that you're talking about too, right? Like the T Dunks, Peter, Malna uh, Peter Malnati is down here. We've seen, we've seen him pop uh, on these type of courses. Uh, Bryce Garnett, maybe Bryce Garnett is a guy who just plays good at these like OHL, like these coastal courses, the Puerto Rico Open which kind of have a similar, the Corrales, a similar feel to this one. This one's a little bit more, I would say, uh, elite to, you know, to, uh, for lack of better word uh, from those tournaments. Uh, but he's someone too that can pop up at this type of course and Ryan Armour, right? Ryan Armour who putts well, we know that he can get on a hot putter, but you're right. I, I have the same type of, of roster construction right now where I don't have a ton of guys at the top, but I'm really trying to do scattershot down here in the 6K range. All right, well, let's try to build a best plays lineup. If you were just saying, you know what? I don't care about ownership. I'm not going to do too much research. I just want to look into it. And I'll enter this lineup too, see how it does. Oh, I got a free ticket into the drive to the green. What, what a hero. I'll throw this into the big five this week. 50K to first. Wish it was more than that because I'm going to win it this week. I wish it was worth a million dollars. So who are the best plays? Webb Simpson's a best play, right? Has to be. Yeah. Has to be here at the 10K range. Yeah. So 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 Webb Simpson and Abe answer, I would say, are one and two from the 10K and 8K. Mm -hmm. Like the obvious plays of the week. After that, I think you go to the very top of that seven thousand dollar, you throw in Siwoo and probably Charlie Hoffman, right? 
Yeah, Hoffman's second in all the categories that you basically need here. Yeah, give me Charlie. Okay, so we'll go with those two. Who after that? Maybe Chris Kirk at 75? Yeah, Chris Kirk has been playing so well. It'd be hard to fade him. I agree. All right, that leaves us $7,200 left for our last spot. Uh, who is the best play from 7,200 and down? Is it Gim? That's either Gim, uh, Michael Thompson, or, uh, yeah, I think I would argue one of those two guys. I mean, if you want to do course form, it's Snedeker a little bit, but like, I would argue that I'd rather play the upside with Gim, um, or with Thompson. Yeah. The don't overthink it. Just play the best guys lineup is Webb, Answer, Siwoo, Hoffman, Kirk, and Doug Gim. That's the lineup. Let's go. Win me 50K, pal. Please don't split that with me. That's lineup right there. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's funny because I made one of these lineups last week at the Masters. Just like the don't overthink it. Like, don't worry about ownership. Don't do anything. Uh, just play the best guys lineup. And it was like one of my only six of sixes. So <laughs> might be a new strategy <laughs> I, that I take. Yeah, I can't wait for this one to hit. Just be like all the stuff that you and I talk about. Like, here's what you need to worry about in strategy. Sometimes you just need to say, like, F it and just do it this way. F it. Yeah. Just play the best guys. Uh, play the plays and you'll be good to go. The combined ownership for this lineup is going to be like 170%. <laughs> yeah, but that's all right. Because if it hits, it hits. So if these guys are top, you know, one through six, if it hits, it hits. And well, I, I think it left, leaves $300 on the tables. So maybe that'll separate me enough when it comes down to it. Maybe that's all it takes. Uh, and we'll see which some of the chalk, although the chalk has been hitting this year. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like in years previous or in sort of these pockets previous, right. We've seen like the bigger, I think, I think 2019, we saw a ton of long shots win, right. Or like guys who hadn't won in a long time. And then 2020, when we came back from, from the shutdown, it was these guys in like the 20, to 50 to 60 K or a 60 to one range. Um, and now we're seeing a resurgence. Um, you guys touched on it yesterday of these guys who haven't won in a long time, come back to form. So shit, maybe it is a brand Snedeker week. Maybe one of these guys can come back into form a little bit. Um, maybe it's a Kyle Stanley week, but. Oh dear uh, God. I, so. I, I certainly oh, hope God. Not. Right. I just bet Pat and Kazire. I just bet Pat and Kazire at 175 to one while you were talking. <laughs> Good. Good. I want that. Cause I, I want that to be, I want that to be minted into an NFT. Uh, I just bet Patton Kazire at 175 to one. Um, yeah, you're right. Like he plays well at these courses. Just yeah, it's bet. funny. My betting card this week is like I bet Morikawa at, at 20 to one. And then I have no one else. I have a whole bunch of guys from 80 to one and like much, much higher. So I think that's just the way I'm going to play it. I might take one other guy like from the semi top uh, and just roll with all these long shots and hope like two of them get into contention on Sunday. Yeah, like when you when you take a look at the top the top guys, I, I think Morikawa at twenty is great because right now I'm seeing him on the DK sports DK sportsbook at plus eighteen hundred. He might actually even be lower uh, lower than that right now. But I would argue that right now that's the most like I, I could get behind that bet the most just because of how well he's playing. And then Daniel Berger right at, at plus two thousand. Um, how much stock do you put into a guy who's already won this season not being able to win this? I don't put a ton. But yeah, Morikawa would be probably be from the top my favorite, if not a guy like Answer, who I think is is a little like he's a little overpriced right now, twenty five hundred. But I do think this course sets up really nice for him. I saw some drift on Answer. I, I see him at thirty three to one now. I think that the initial odds opened and everyone was like twenty five to one. Like good god, yeah. I'm not gonna bet that. Then they took no bets on it. They're like, I mean, maybe we need to drop him down a little bit here, uh, coming into it. So yeah, he doesn't need to be priced the same as Morikawa, who's like the number four player in the world. Uh, I do <laughs> love Answer. Like he's a great player, and this number is far more palatable to me. I might just end up betting Siwoo at forty to one, just so if he wins, I'm not like oh. But like Sergio at 40 is a decent number. I'll go over what the bets are going to be on the Wednesday live show and I'll, I'll tweet that out and add everything to the newsletter. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to be like a long shot, long shot rolling week. Probably double up with all those guys as first round leaders as well and just see how the chips fall. I'm not winning any. I haven't won since fucking Morikawa anyway. So I might as well try a new strategy. Yeah. And like you mentioned it too earlier this week is, you know, save some, right? Because this course can really. Guys can shoot a low scores here. Um, so save some for the weekend. Save some, save some for Sunday morning, uh, Sunday afternoon, because that can, that can also be a viable strategy. Yeah, the the, sun, the Sunday comeback is no stranger to the RBC oh. heritage. Yeah, and it's great, especially when you have that ticket Sunday morning and it's, you know, an 80 to 1. And the guy who you just see shoot a 60 here, uh, it's a great feeling. So, yeah, keep, keep some bullets in the chamber.
Yeah, and then we're all going to be sitting here on Sunday, and it's like, oh, Dustin won by 15. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, that's that's well within reason, right? Like, he can shoot 80s and then come back and do what he did at the Travelers, right? That's well within reason for a guy like Dustin. That's why I said at the very top, even though he's not playing well, even though there's guys like a Webb Simpson who's the best player in that range, if you're getting Dustin at that type of ownership, it's just that's like that is too tantalizing to not at least throw him in a couple of lineups. Dustin Morikawa. I think that's how I'm going to be starting my teams. Anyway, Reed Fowler. Follow him on Twitter at Reed T. Fowler. Check out his work on DK Live. What you got going on this week? Uh, I got a show with uh, Ulrich. Ulrich coming up. I almost forgot his name. I was going to say the fantasy grind. But Jeff Ulrich and I do a Q&A show on our YouTube channel, on DraftKings YouTube channel. That happens around 3 o'clock where you guys just load up your questions the same way Mayo does tomorrow. This is just a little bit earlier um, where you guys can come in and load up those questions. And then uh, the pivots article that I do is coming out on Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, usually. Uh, but rather, other than that, I'm gearing up for the NFL draft as well, Pat. That's coming up in like two weeks. Uh, I blinked and the NFL is already coming back. So we got that and a bunch of other stuff. NBA, MLB, all the guys are doing a, a DK Live. So that's where all the work is. All right. I'm Pat Mayo. You can follow me at the PME on Twitter. You can also subscribe to Mayo Media Network if you have not done that yet. And the podcast live show. 12 p.m. Eastern Time on Mayo Media Network on Wednesday. There's also a Euro Tour show out right now. Tom and Sky covering the Austrian Open. That should be a fun one. Maybe you can make some doubles along the way. Some long shot doubles take. I don't know. Who the hell are they taking? Let's see here. Who did Sky take? Little oh, Matthias. Oh, good. Oh, Hor- Rob? It looks like they're both on horsey. That, that's Cam's guy. Cam was always like, David Horsey. <laughs> uh, so horsey <laughs> plus Michael Thompson win a million dollars and you'll be good to go. How about that? Oh, that's perfect. Um, a little Kurt Kitayama. He's he's up there in odds. But yeah, uh, I I know nothing. Don't take my advice. I haven't done any research on the the Austrian Open. Go uh, go watch those guys. And Sky's the best. So go go read his stuff. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo to get yourself 20% off right now. Like Reed, I have shorter videos up on the DraftKings YouTube page as well if you want to go check those out. I'm Pat Mayo. Thank you for watching. Good luck at the Heritage. I'll see you next time. Family experience! Experience!